If there is a culinary Bible in Europe, it's the Michelin Guides. For decades, travelers in the know, as well as residents of Europe's great cities, have depended on them for the latest reports on the best in dining and lodging. Now the folks at Michelin have discovered the new world. New York and San Francisco are the cities to first receive the honor of a book. The director of Michelin Guides, Jean-Luc Naré, tells Canapé about the standards and ambitions of the series. When we decided to come to the United States, New York was the right port of entry um, because of the diversity of the culinary scene here, because it's a, it's a gastronomic city, we decided to come here straight and, uh, and to launch the guide to New York as a first Michelin Guide to the States. Now, after the success we encountered last year, San Francisco was a natural choice. Uh, because of it was the, really the origin of the organic cuisine. It was really a place where food is serious there. And it was very interesting to go there as a newcomer and with a different eye. Our inspectors are not known. They're not being recognized when they go to restaurants. They are the eye and the palate of the consumer. Not only one inspector go there, but multiple inspectors at multiple times but with the same criteria. And uh, we're very happy about the fact that we recognize talent there. We're not recognized before. One star restaurant in New York should be at the same level than one star restaurant in France or same level as one star in Spain. When you actually got a Michelin star, it not only saying that you among the 300 or 500 best restaurants of your category in New York or in San Francisco, it means that you're among the 1,000 best restaurants in the world. When you have a two star Michelin, is you're among the 360 best restaurants in the world. And when you have three star Michelin, it means that you're among the 60 best restaurants in the world. So when you actually got three star and you're among the 60 best restaurants in the world, well, you need to be good every time. And that's the reason we're very particular on that. Bib Gourmand is, we used to call them here, inspector's favorite. That the places where the value for money is very good, you have actually extraordinary food for a very limited amount. And in, in Europe, it's about s between 30 to 35 euros. And it's a place where, where inspectors will go back with their own pocket money, if they have to, and will take the trends. You have incredible products here. You have incredible technique about how to do it and everything else. And you have the right clientele to do. So the main difference between a three-star Michelin in Europe and three-star Michelin in the States would be that it's the same quality, same impress thing with, with the food, and everything is about the plate, and the stars are really in the plate. Uh, but at the same time, because it's a dynamic environment, when you go to a three-star restaurant in France or all over Europe, it's about 45 seats. It's a very like a ceremony. You go to this restaurant, there's no one who's been seated at your table before. The table has been hired specially for you, and that's your piece of real estate for the entire evening. Here in New York, it's not the same. You could have 150 covers a night and you will have 150 members of the team as well working for this 150 nights. So your table will be relay three times, but it's not affecting the food. So I think here it's more business driven in a sense. But because it's more business driven, it's great as well. Where else could you go in the world in a three star Michelin restaurant, like you go to Jean Georges at lunchtime and get this $28 menu? Three star. <laughs> It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. So, yes, we're very happy that uh, New York is so vibrant in terms of gastronomy. And apparently, it is actually attracting a lot of chefs now around the world who want to come from London, from France, from all parts of, uh, of the world, even Japan, and move to New York. I know we're not here to replace anyone. Uh, we're here to continue to, New Yorkers will continue to read the New York Times, will continue to buy the Zagat. And obviously some of them will buy the Michelin Guide and see as a different alternative. So yes, we're very lucky to be here. We're very happy to have the success of what happened this year in New York. And we're very happy to launch a second edition this year. In Paris, if you want to get to know a neighborhood, make that an arrondissement, find the local cafe that seems to have a steady clientele. It's the place where people park unwind with wine or wind up with a couple of shots of espresso. In Avenue Montaigne, the new film from Danielle Thompson, a recently arrived waitress at the local cafe, finds herself intertwined with three families of regular customers. The director and her son, who also co-wrote the screenplay and acts in the film, tell Canapé about their bit of Paris. 
You can say very simply that it's a story of a young girl who comes from the middle of France to discover Paris and try to find a job in a, in a very luxurious cultural area of Paris and, uh, and she meets all these different characters who are all people who seem to have everything wants in life, everything one wishes, uh, a career, uh, success, money, recognition. And she meets all these people and, uh, and realizes that none of them really have what, what they want or at least that you never really have what you want or at least when you get it, you want something else. The part I play, um, he's, the, he's the son of a very wealthy man and, uh, and basically the two of them have lost any kind of communication. The mother has died, she was probably the link between both of them and uh, now there's no link and they're trying somehow or another to get, to get this communication back and it's a very important time for them um, these three days. Um, working together as mother and son is, um, this is our third film we've written together. I feel it's a very privileged thing to be able to have this space um, and it's, it's really a window onto the other person's intimacy and creativity and uh, inside this family relationship that's a very um, it's a very privileged uh, thing to have accomplished, I feel now. I jumped into this new, new work because it's very new, it's very different from just being a screenwriter. I discovered that I probably missed something for a long time which was working directly with actors. This is an enormous pleasure and with actors like these, I mean, they completely change into actors the moment they're on the set, they become uh, almost relieved that they're not directors anymore, that they are not going to be asked what to do, but they're going to be told what to do. And uh, this was very amusing and very refreshing and, and fascinating. Born in Turkey, raised in Switzerland and educated at Stanford University, Metin Arditi is a man of many faces a successful businessman and philanthropist. He serves as president of the highly regarded L'Orchestre de la Suisse Romande. But it is as one of the best writers from French-speaking Switzerland that he has come to the attention of many readers. Canapé chats with Arditi the author about Arditi, the man of many interests. I wrote a book about Van Gogh, not on Van Gogh, but about Van Gogh, and my childhood, which is called La Chambre de Vincent. This book ends in New York, in the Metropolitan Museum. And the book ends by these words, Je n'ai jamais autant aimé New York. I never loved New York so much. That was in 2001. Uh, two and a half years later, the reason why I was in New York materializes, that is to say, the Orchestre de la Suisse Romande plays in New York. And there is a crew of the Swiss TV that interviews me and wants to do the interview, part of the interview, at the Metropolitan Museum, and asks me to comment the paintings. I was writing a new novel, which since then came out, was published. And when I finished the interview, which lasted maybe eight or 10 minutes, there are only 15 paintings of Van Gogh in the two Annenberg gallery, in the two rooms of the Annenberg galleries. I was again so moved that I said to myself, I have to get back to Vincent Van Gogh. And I wrote last letter to Theo, dernière lettre à Theo. But I wanted this letter to uh, to be played. And as I was writing and rewriting and rewriting, I kept reading my text at a loud voice all the time uh, in order to uh, try to combine a text of literary quality with a text that could be uh, spoken, said and, and acted. But it took a lot of time. Uh, there are few, uh, there are what, 35 pages, small pages. And it took me about 10 months of intense work. I have written essays, 
on uh, on uh, philosophers. Uh, probably the one that is closest to my heart is the one I wrote on Nietzsche. And then a personal story, which is La Chambre de Vincent, this text, Last Letter to Theo, and uh, a few novels. It's always about life. And my view is that the most difficult thing is to express love. And the place of art in life is really what helps everybody. It helps the artist burn himself. And this is basically what he wants. He doesn't want it safe. And it helps the reader or the spectator or the listener to music understand that in his own pain, he's not alone. And it helps him, ça l'aide à aller de l'avant dans la vie. It helps him advance in life. At the age of seven, my parents sent me, they stayed in Turkey. I went to a boarding school in Switzerland where I stayed for 11 years. In that boarding school, the French became my language. It's, uh, I consider it my, more than my language, my house. Uh, and I had the chance, because there were kids from all over the place, I had the chance to learn Italian very easily. There were many Italians, English, etc. So it, it all happened naturally, easily. But of course, French is, is my language, and again, more than my language, it's my house. At the age of 50, there was a very strange combination. I entered the, uh, the board of the Orchestre de la Suisse Romande, of which I'm chairman, and I started writing. Of course, music helps a lot, uh, the exercise of writing, and the fact that I have a chance to write helps me also develop sensitivity which is useful in my work and I would say that I'm very lucky I'm very very lucky Joanne Svach charmed critics and readers with The Rabbi's Cat his graphic novel of life in the old Jewish quarters of Algeria that story came from his father's side of the family he now turns to his mother's East European origins in Klezmer, Tales of the Wild East, the story of just about the craziest Klezmer band this side of Odessa. It all adds up to what one admiring critic calls a goofy, somewhat twisted vaudeville routine. The author paints his world for Canapé. In many ways, I guess uh, my new comic book, Klezmer, might be an answer to the rabbi's cat. The Rabbi's Cat was a, was a tribute to my father's family. It was a Jewish family from Northern Africa with a father, his daughter, and the family cat. And it was about a family. On the other hand, Klezmer occurs in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, in my mother's family. And it's not a family. It's a, a band of friends. And uh, in Klezmer, it's much more uh, a kind of uh, violent story with the very young people. And the hero, he looks like a cat, but he's a young Jewish guy. And he gets rid of his Judaism. He goes to, to the snow. He wants to play music. He wants to fall in love. And um, it's a way of answering some question we were into the rabbi's cat. And even in a formal point of view, uh, the rabbi's cat was uh, very clean with uh, very bright colors, whereas Klezmer comes with a watercolor. And I do all the drawings into a big sketchbook. So I try to have this much more intense and maybe uh, a little bit of uh, musicality. I call it like a jazz drawing, you know. There are blanks between the, the lines. Uh, the, the color does not go everywhere. Because I try to do, which seems difficult, is to put music into the silent world of comic books. Another thing is that in the Rabbi Scat, it was a very classical Jewish girl. She obeys her father. She will marry the guy who comes. And the father says, you have to marry this guy. Whereas in Klezmer, I wanted her to be more modern, as a girl could be in Russia because uh, life was uh, more difficult, uh, because of anti-Semitism, but because also of the rabbi's world, who was very hard with a lot of rules and so on. So she wants to escape. So I wanted the same girl to live in a different world and to see what she will become. 
My father's a pianist. He used to play in bars and nightclubs and so on. And my mother uh, used to be a singer. So I always was very fond of with the popular music. And I love uh, klezmer, which is the Jewish music from Eastern Europe. And I, uh, I love this music. And I wanted to draw musicians. Every time there is a, con a show in France or wherever I can go, I draw the musician. And, and I love to draw musical instruments. And I feel like I want to do Western that occurs into the eastern part of the world, so eastern eastern, and instead of the guns, I put guitars and harmonicas and so on, but I try the, to have musical scenes as intense as in Sergio Leone's westerns, you know, it's like, uh, okay, he's gonna play music, but he's gonna play better than the other one, and they'll be offended. And you know, it's like, it's like a, a riot, but with uh, music. My favorite klezmer band is the Amsterdam klezmer band, and they say, we have to give Klezmer a strict credibility. And when they talk about this, they say, we have to do with Klezmer what the Pogs did with Irish music. It means you take a music which, which is about folklore and you give it to the youth and let them do something with it. And I like when people borrow a music and use it and forget about who used to carry this burden, you know? It's not the burden of the Jews, it's just, uh, just good music. So my way of working is uh, quite similar every day, even on Sunday. Uh, I wake up around, around 7 in the morning, I take care of my children, and at 9 o'clock I go to my office and I start to draw. And I draw panel after panel, without sketches. And uh, when it's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I go out to have lunch with friends. And then I work into pubs and bars with the same sketchbook, because my whole story is into a small sketchbook I, I can take with me everywhere. And uh, my friends are not offended, they are used to this, uh, this mad behavior, so they say, okay, he's like that. And uh, they prefer when I draw, because when I take my violin, it's noisy, and you say, they say, go back to your drawing. <laughs> it was very, fu very funny, well, sadly funny to work on Klezmer, because all I did to go to tenderness and love always took me back back to sad things. I mean, I put a whole energy about the love stories between the two young people, and I love the very erotic scene when they go into a bath and, uh, and when they, they are very tender one to the other. And I go to the story and I, I seem, it always goes back to violence, always goes back to pogrom, to whatever, and I try to avoid this, but when you depict a historical period, it, uh, it takes you always with, with it, and I, I feel, this kind of uh, opposition between, on one hand, the love scenes I try to depict, and on the other hand, the awful photographs I see in my documentation when I, I try to get uh, involved into those times, it makes a very strange feeling, and maybe that's why I love those characters so much, because I try to protect them. I am always to say, okay, let's try nothing harm them, you know, but uh, sometimes you're not master of your story. It's very, very strange to see sometimes a character must die, and you don't want him to die, but you're not the writer of the story. It's like if you were to take it some way in the clouds, and, and that's why uh, it's as much exciting to write a story than to leave something, because even if you're the writer, you don't know precisely what will occur. Most movies tell stories in familiar worlds. But some movies take us in other artistic directions to other places. One of those places is Bamako, the African city that is also the title of writer-director Abderrahman Sissako's new film. Mix a troubled marriage with a trial and add the spice of a Western starring Danny Glover, but filmed in Timbuktu. That's a taste of the cinematic stew cooked up for audiences by the director from Mali. He tells Canapé about his recipe for a distinctly African experience. Bamako uh, is a process, improbable, certainly, but it's a uh, process between two great institutions. It's the same who dirigent, I would say, the world, the Bank Mondial and the FMI, and who inflict these words on a whole continent and who try to soigne these words. Donc c'est une prise de conscience, mon film est une prise de conscience d'une société civile, cette fois-ci africaine, qui est consciente de ce qui lui arrive, même si elle n'a pas la capacité de changer ça. Dans un monde irrémédiablement ouvert, il faut civiliser la mondialisation et lui donner un sens.
Que pensez-vous de ce passage de cet article Est-ce que oui ou non, des progrès peuvent être faits dans le cours de la mondialisation Est-ce que oui ou non, par exemple, si les normes qui sont en vigueur au sein de l'Organisation internationale du travail étaient généralisées, ce serait une bonne chose Ou est-ce que ça encore, ça ne servirait à rien qu'à opprimer les Africains Je me lève en faux contre le point de départ, le monde ouvert. Nous ne vivons pas dans un monde ouvert, M. Rapaport. Je crois que ce que vous avez lu répond et tout à fait avec éloquence aux questions que vous posez. S'il y a lieu d'améliorer, de civiliser la mondialisation, c'est qu'elle décivilise, elle déshumanise. Vous me dites que les candidats africains à l'émigration qui sont des réfugiés économiques, qui sont arrêtés, menottés, rapatriés, humiliés, que nous recevons aujourd'hui, si vous me dites que devant cette terrible réalité que le monde entier a regardé avec consternation que nous vivons dans un monde ouvert, alors il est certainement ouvert aux blancs, mais il n'est pas ouvert aux noirs. In a very simple way, and in a very delicate way, it, 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 it is the kind of uh, micro look, uh, and an, an economist tend to look, use the word macro and micro. It's a micro look uh, at, at what is happening to people in the world. How they're, they're forced into deeper and deeper cycles of, of insecurity and poverty and, and how their, their future and their future possibilities are, are becoming sh shallower and shallower. Et voilà quelques problèmes techniques, mais tout rentrera dans l'ordre dans quelques instants. I think, in a, in a sense, of course, uh, the, the Western spaghetti move part, the, the movie and within a movie that I'm a part of, is it's, it's kind of parody on the West itself, uh, the, the parody on the genre of the Western. Uh, and as we know, the, 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 the Western is, um, in a sense, uh, in a sense, a, a, a metaphor for uh, the, the expansion of empire. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, images of the West, uh, Western, are the, the primary images of, of, of American colonization and also it is annihilation of the, the indigenous people who live there. Um, it, it's a glorified uh, uh, image uh, of this, this West. Aimé Césaire a fait beaucoup de prophéties dans ce sens-là, beaucoup d'autres comme celui-là, qui est une réalité. En 1950 déjà, Césaire disait cela. Et c'est vrai, c'est vrai qu'il euh, y a eu, il y a, euh, dans le destin de ce continent, après l'esclavage, après la colonisation, il y a une forme de colonisation, une nouvelle forme de colonisation, qui est, qui est celle de l'argent qui est le néocolonialisme, il y a plus, c'est celle des multinationales, c'est la privatisation des biens fondamentaux du continent. Comment peut-on privatiser l'eau d'un pays C'est-à-dire quand tu bois un verre d'eau dans ton pays, tu sers une multinationale qui se trouve euh, à Washington, euh, à Londres ou je ne sais où. C'est ça la réalité du monde aujourd'hui. Et c'est ça qui est, il y a un monde qui se privatise tous les jours. Césaire dit cela. Nous payons beaucoup plus que ne constitue aujourd'hui le montant réel de nos budgets. Ce cadre d'intervention aujourd'hui créé par la Banque mondiale va servir finalement à quoi Juste à étouffer le feu qui couvrait toujours. C'est le feu tout simplement de l'indigence imposée. C'est le feu en fait d'un colonialisme terrible. C'est le feu d'une exploitation qui ne porte même plus de nom. Et c'est la disparition, en fait, de certaines nations. On maintient tout juste, aujourd'hui, dans ce système international, 
Si nous y allons pour participer, c'est tout juste parce que nous sommes des bons petits marchés et des pourvoyeurs d'argent. C'est nous qui donnons tout aujourd'hui à l'Amérique du Nord et c'est nous qui donnons tout à l'Europe. I think that Césaire recognized that in, in, in his extraordinary work, since he's an extraordinary visionary, uh, it recognized that in, in uh, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, he recognized the possibility in, in the trends toward this, even at a time when it seemed as if the power, power around the world was being decentralized to some extent with the breakup of the colonial system. But certainly within, within the framework of this colonial system are uh, other issues uh, now, and we face those issues right now. The question is that, that how are we going to now uh, be driven by another imperative beyond the images that we've already created, the images that, that, that have been bought, uh, the images that have been sold, the images that we see on our television and in our branding and our marketing, et cetera, et cetera. How are now we going to sell the other, another image, another perception of the world and understanding of the world and then act accordingly? Si, uh, if you faire un film aujourd'hui, le film le plus urgent, c'est ce cri-là. C'est le cri de ceux à qui on ne donne pas la parole. Pas parce que les gens ne sont pas conscients, je ne suis pas plus conscient de la situation de l'Afrique, Zeke Bamba, le chanteur, ou quelqu'un d'autre. Mais euh, je fais un travail de passeur dans ce sens. Et ce travail de passeur euh, m'oblige euh, à aborder les sujets qui concernent tout simplement la vie. Un pays qui n'a pas sa communication, qui n'a pas son énergie, qui n'a pas son transport, difficilement peut s'appeler un pays souverain. Et ce sont justement ces domaines que les multinationales veulent nous retirer. C'est ça. C'est pourquoi il ne faut pas qu'on se laisse faire. C'est difficile, mais je suis plus optimiste que l'enfer. <rire>